Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. Today is Wednesday, which means we are in the book Anxious for Nothing by John MacArthur. And last week we said that we were going to finish the first chapter this week, but further inspection of the book. This chapter is very long, so we're just going to do another little section out of this chapter. Yeah, there's several little like sub topics in in amongst the chapter yes. so the one that we're gonna do today is actually seven pages so we figured we you guys probably don't want to sit for more than seven like yeah typically like seven or eight pages of reading is kind of enough to sit for so we don't want you guys to have to devote your whole day to sit and listen like you actually would do that anyways i wouldn't so i would not we don't expect you guys to want to do that so yeah we're just going to do one section today and hopefully God will still speak to us and teach us through it. So we're in the chapter observing how God cares for you. And then the little subtitle that we're going to be doing today is worry is unnecessary because of our father. We're going to start reading and hopefully we can get something out of it. And hopefully you can get something out of it. If you guys haven't ever heard of this book, um, we have done the introduction and the other part of chapter one. So if you guys want, you can go back to our channel and watch those and it will get you caught up to where we're starting out today. All right. Worry is unnecessary because of our father. It is unnecessary to worry about finances, the basics of life, and what we eat or drink or wear because of who our heavenly father is. Have we forgotten what he is like? My children never worry about where they're going to get their next meal or whether they have clothes, a bed, or something to drink. Such thoughts never enter their minds because they knew enough about me to know that I would provide for them, and I don't come close to being as faithful as God. Yet how often we fail to believe that God is going to provide for us as well as the average earthly father. If your concept of God is right and you see him as owner, controller, and provider, and beyond that as your loving father, then you know you have nothing to worry about. Jesus said, What man is there among you when his, when his son shall ask him for a loaf Will he get, will give him a stone? Or if he shall ask for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? And that's from Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Since all things come under God's control, rest assured, he controls those things on behalf of his children. Jesus illustrates that with three observations from nature. I love that scripture, by the way. Because it's a good reminder of, like, we're mere humans and we can surprise each other and give each other great gifts and, and it makes our hearts happy. And if we're able to give such good gifts, then imagine the gifts that God can give us. Anyways, God always feeds his creatures. In Matthew six twenty six, Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? I can imagine the Lord standing on a hillside up in Galilee, looking over the beautiful north end of the sea, the breeze ripping across the water, the sun bright in the sky. Since that part of the Sea of Galilee was known as a cross crossroads of bird migration, perhaps Jesus saw a flock fly by as he spoke. He wants us to think about birds. Here's one observation. Birds don't get together and say, We've got to come up with a strategy to keep ourselves alive. They have no self-consciousness or ability to reason, but God has planted within them the instinct or divine capacity to find what is necessary to live. God doesn't just create life. He also sustains it. Job 38, 41 and Psalm 147, 9 tells us that baby birds cry out to God for their food. Jesus tells us that even though they don't sow or reap or gather surplus into their barns, their Heavenly Father hears and provides for them. Now that isn't an excuse for idleness. You won't see a bird standing out on the edge of a tree with its mouth wide open. Perhaps you've noticed it never rains worms. God feeds birds, <laughs> God feeds birds through the instinct that tells them where to find the food. They work hard for it. They're always busy searching, gobbling up little insects, preparing their nests, caring for their young, teaching them to fly, pushing them out of the nest, and at the right time, migrating with the seasons, and so on. All this work is to be done if they are going to eat, yet they never overdo it. 
Not even in your strangest dream would a bird say, I'm gonna go build a bigger nest. I'm gonna go store more worms. I'm gonna say to myself, bird, bird eat, drink, and be merry. Birds work within the framework of God's design and never overindulge themselves. They get fat only when people put them in cages. Birds don't worry about where they're going to find food. They just go about their business until they find it. And they always do because God is looking out for them. Birds have no reason to worry. And if they don't, what are you worrying for? Jesus put it this way, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very last hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. And that's in Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Are you not much better than a bird? No bird was ever created in the image of God. No bird was ever designed to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ. No bird was ever prepared a place in heaven in the Father's house. If God sustains the life of a bird, don't you think he'll take care of you? Life is a gift from God. If God gives you the greater gift of life itself, don't you think he will give you the lesser gift of sustaining that life? Of course he will, so don't worry about it. Keep in mind, of course, that like a bird, we all have to work because God has designed that man should earn his bread by the sweat of his brow, Genesis 3:19. If we don't work, it is not fitting that we eat. Well, the birds eat, the birds work too. God doesn't just, like it said, it doesn't just rain worms. Like they have to work for their food. They have to go out and like do their part. If we do not work, it is not fitting that we eat, 2 Thessalonians 3:10. Just as God provides for the birds through their instinct, so God provides for man through his efforts. Some people fear we are running out of resources. I read a brochure from the United States Department of Agriculture titled, Is the World Facing Starvation? that gives these answers to two commonly asked questions. First question is, is the world's food supply large enough to meet everyone's minimum needs? The answer is, the world has more than enough food to feed every man, woman, and child in it. If the world's food supply had been evenly divided and distributed among the world's population for the last 18 years, each person would have received more than the minimum number of calories. From 1960 to the present, world food grain production never dropped below 103% of the minimum requirement and averaged 108% between 1973 and 1977. If a system existed today to distribute grain equally, the world's 4 billion people would have available about one-fifth more grain per person than the 2.7 billion people had 25 years ago. Wow. So everybody would have more than enough to survive. The second question is, hasn't the amount of food produced per person been dropping in the developing countries of the world over the last 25 years? And the answer is, this is a common misconception. Food produced in the developing countries has been increasing. World per capita food production declined only twice in the last 25 years. Production of grain, the primary food for most of the world's people, rose from 290 kilograms per person during the early 1950s to an average of 360 kilograms some 40 years later, about a 25% increase. Obviously, some of the statistics have changed, but the essential fact remains the same. There is more food on earth than ever. When God says he will provide, he means just that. Every time you see a bird, let it serve as a reminder of God's abundant provision. May it stop cold any worry you might have. Worry is unable to accomplish anything productive. Jesus gives another practical observation that highlights the folly of worry. Which of you, by being anxious, can add to his lifespan? Matthew 6:27. Not only will you not lengthen your life by worrying, but you will probably shorten it. Charles Mayo, co-founder of the Mayo Clinic, made the observation that worry adversely affects the circulatory system, heart, glands, and entire nervous system. In the medical journal American Mercury, Mayo said he never knew anyone who died of overwork, but he knew many who died of worry. You can worry yourself to death but you'll never worry yourself into a longer life. We live in a day when people are in panic to lengthen their lives. They have an excessive interest in vitamins, health spas, diet, and exercise. God, however, has previously determined how long we shall live. Job 14.5 says of man, his days 
are determined, the number of his months is with thee, and his limits thou hast set so that he cannot pass. Does that mean we should disregard sensible advice about our diet and exercise? Of course not. It will increase the quant the it will increase the quality of our lives, but there's no guarantee about the quantity. When I exercise and eat right, my body and brain work better and I feel better all around. But I'm not going to kid myself that by jogging in the neighborhood every day and eating hefty quantities of complex car carbohydrates that I'm going to force God to let me live longer. To worry about how long you are going to live and how to add years onto your life is to distrust God. If you give him your life and are obedient to him, he will give you the fullness of days. You will experience life to the fullest when you live it to the glory of God. No matter how long or short, it will be wonderful. God arrays even the meadows in splendor. Jesus gives another illustration from nature on why not to worry. Why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Matthew six twenty eight through 30 For some people, the most important place in their whole world is the closet. <laughs> what? <laughs> you hang out in your closet? No. <laughs> Instead of being afraid... They won't have anything to wear. A major concern in biblical times, these jaded individuals fear not being able to look their best. Lusting after costly clothes is a common sin in our society. Mm. Whenever I walk that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I walk through a shopping mall, I am overwhelmed by how much stuff is hanging on the racks. I don't know how those stores can sustain their inventory. We have made a God out of fashion. We indulge in a spending spree to drape our bodies with things that have nothing to do with the beauty of character. Let nor your adornment be external, only braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. 1 Peter 3, 3-4. through if you want to talk about fancy clothing, though, Jesus tells us that the best this world has to offer doesn't even compare to the lilies of the field. Matthew 6, 28. That's a general term for all the wildflowers that grace the rolling hills of Galilee, such as... Anemones? I thought that was in the ocean. Me too. <laughs> Maybe there's a flower called anemones. Such as anemones. 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 Gladiolas, narcissus, and poppies. They do not toil, nor do they spin, verse 28. You won't find one making fancy thread to drape over itself and saying, I've been scarlet for two whole days now. I think I'd like to be blue tomorrow. <laughs> but seriously, though, he's hitting a hard. I feel called out, you know? <laughs> Look at the simplest flowers around you. There is a free and easy beauty about them. You can take the most glorious garment ever made for a great monarch like Solomon, put it under a microscope, and it will look like sackcloth. But if you likewise examine the petal of a flower, you could become lost in the wonder of what you would see. If you've ever taken a good look at a flower, you know there is a texture, form, design, substance, and color that man, with all his ingenuity, cannot come close to duplicating. So what is the point? That if God so arrays the grass of the fields which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you? Matthew 6:30. Wildflowers have a very short lifespan. People would gather dead batches of them as a cheap source of fuel for their portable cooking furnaces. Hmm. A God who would lavish such beauty on temporary fire fodder certainly will provide the necessary clothing for his eternal children. An anonymous poem expresses this lesson simply. Said the wildflower to the sparrow, I should really like 
to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so, said the sparrow to the wildflower. Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Aww. I like that. So that's it for what we're going to read today. That but, really hit hard. Yeah. I think that was enough hard hitting for the day. <laughs> I feel beaten down. <laughs> Scrape me off the floor. <laughs> Here, let me go get the shovel. Seriously, though, like, how many of us are guilty of that? Yeah. Like, I, I walk into a store and I'm like, that. I need that, and I need that, and ooh, I want that so bad. And, I mean... We really don't need those things. We don't need those things, and we live in a world where a lot of times we get those things, and we're so much more concerned with that than just how God created us. And like I said, like if you put a flower under the microscope while she was reading that, how intricate and detailed God created a flower to be. And I don't know, it just brings to mind how beautifully created that God has made each one of us. And we don't see that. Like we, for some reason, it's like we have blinders on. Like we can see beauty in other people, but we have blinders on when we look at and, and assess ourselves. So, and a good lesson. Thanks, John. <laughs> Keeping us in line. Yeah, that was a good reminder, and uh, I really did like that last quote. I like that, too. So, that is it for this part of this chapter. <laughs> we still have three more subtopics, but it's like seven or eight pages the same as this week, so it won't be super long either. So, we hope that you guys got something out of this chapter, not out of the chapter, but <laughs> out of this little subsection we definitely know that we got something yes. out of this. So yeah. we hope that you got something out of it also. And be sure to join us for the rest of the chapter. And also, if you came in this chap in this part of the chapter, be sure to go and watch the first part of it and also the intro to the entire book. Yes, because there's some good stuff in there. Even though it's like the intro, the way that he did the introduction really just kind of it just lays out how important it is to trust God and how silly it is for us to let anxiety rule our lives all the time. So yeah, I, I would highly recommend, even if you don't want to sit through us reading all these chapters of this whole entire book, go watch the intro. Other than that, we also post videos on Mondays and Fridays. Monday videos are Bible study videos, and then Friday videos are just fun silly videos something that we enjoy doing so if you guys do enjoy us be sure to like and subscribe to our channel and if you want to be notified when we upload be sure to hit the little bell after you subscribe we hope you guys have a good day have a good week and we hope to see you in the next one bye, bye.